Hello, friend. Welcome to the Whole Word Podcast. This is Pastor Pitts Evans. On this podcast, we read and discuss one chapter of God's Word per episode. Let's go now to the Bible and see what the Lord has for us today. We're going to begin with our reading of the book of Philippians. And before I start with chapter one, I want to just talk about the book itself a little bit. Of course, it was written by Paul the Apostle. This is one of his so-called prison letters that was written approximately 60 to 62 A.D. while Paul was under house arrest in Rome. Now, Paul had established the church at Philippi during his second missionary journey around 51 A.D., and he visited the church a second time on his third missionary journey, approximately 57 A.D. Philippi, of course, was in Greece. Uh, It was a major city in Europe. And um, this church was a very important early church. Paul apparently had a very close relationship with this church. This letter is one of his most personal writings uh, with personal pronouns used over a hundred times. And so there's several interesting things going on in this letter. One, Paul was concerned about two female leaders who seemed to be in conflict within the church. That's a little unusual, but he also had a lot to say about legalistic Jews that were plaguing this and many of the other Gentile churches. Uh, That's very common in Paul's New Testament writings. And the letter was also somewhat unique in that he commended the Philippian church for their continued financial support and commended them for standing steadfast in the face of persecution. So this was a, a church that Paul had a lot of good things to say about. Now, we'll begin our reading today. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is the best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. 
I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul begins with a fairly typical apostolic introduction and greeting. He writes in verse 1 and 2, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. So right out of the gate, he identifies Timothy as his traveling companion, and he identifies both of them as servants of Christ Jesus. He mentions Jesus' name repeatedly in these first couple of verses. He goes on to say, To all of God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, or elders and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in these first two verses, he mentions God three times and he mentions Jesus Christ three times. I find that fascinating that Paul loves to say the name of Jesus. He loves to say the name of God, and he's imparting grace and peace in this greeting. And then verse 4 and 5 and 6, verse 6 especially, has one of the most important concepts in the Bible to me personally. You see, I struggle with condemnation. I struggle with doubts just like many people do. Although I'm a pastor of many years and a spiritual father to some and leader and and author and speaking on the radio and all that, I still have my doubts about my own walk with the Lord. But these verses give me great peace. Paul writes, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, now this is the key, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, friends, that gives me tremendous peace. Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, began the good work in my heart. My redemption was their plan. And the Bible says they will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's Judgment Day. And so the Lord is the one that began a good work in me. I have confidence in the Lord to complete the work He started in my heart. And whereas I may not have confidence from time to time in myself, to complete the mission and calling on my own life. I have total and complete faith in the ability of God to finish the work He started in my heart. You see the difference. This was not my idea. It was not your idea. It was the Lord's idea. And He who began the good work in you and He who began the good work in me will be faithful to finish the job. We can count on that. We can trust that. Paul goes on to talk about his prayers for the believers in Philippi and for you and me. Verse 9, this is my prayer, he writes, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And so, friends, Paul prayed that we would have more and more love, that we would have more and more knowledge and depth of insight, that we would be able to discern what's best, and that we would be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. I agree with that prayer, and I think you do too. Paul goes on to make an astounding series of declarations. Remember, he's under house arrest in Philippi. He's facing possible execution. Church history records that he was not actually executed at this time, but after a short reprieve, he was executed for his faith. And so he talks about the possibility of death. Verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage 
so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. Now imagine this. Paul is saying that his prayer and his desire is that Jesus would be exalted by his life or Jesus would be exalted by his death. He goes on and writes in verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, if he's alive, it's so that Jesus can live through him. But to die is to gain eternity with Christ. Death is a victory in Christ. Life is a victory in Christ, because our lives are the expression of his life as long as we walk the earth. Verse 22, If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ. Now, he's talking about dying, being executed by the Romans. And he says, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. In other words, Paul was anxious to go and enter eternity, even to the point he had no fear of death from whatever uh, excruciating death the Romans could put on him. But he was ready to stand firm in Christ by life or by death. For to live is Christ and to die is gain. That should be the same attitude in us. We should be able to stand firm in the Lord, knowing that the Lord will complete the work that he began in us. Paul writes in verse 27, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's what we should do, friends. We need to conduct our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, knowing that we're being observed by a lost and dying world. You see, if we don't live righteously for Christ as Christians, how can the lost see a standard raised up to which they can aspire and wish to be attached to? In other words, if we look just like everybody else, what does the world see other than we're just like them? We should be different. We should be living for Christ and living as expressions of the life of Christ in the earth. Lord, I pray that each of us, like Paul, would be able to say, whether by life or by death— Your life is my life, my life for the gospel, my life for Jesus, for me to live as Christ and to die and be with you as gain. May each of us have that same desire and that sense of commitment, and may nothing hinder the spread of your work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Whole Word. It was brought to you by Whole Word Fellowship and the Northern Virginia House of Prayer. If you were encouraged, please share our podcast with your friends. We'd also appreciate it if you'd hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app and take a few moments to write a review. If you'd like more information on our church and our ministry, you can go to wholeword.net or wholewordpodcast.com for more information. Thank you again, and may the Lord Jesus bless you today and always.